Uh, welcome everyone to our breakout session number two, uh, Leveraging LinkedIn with Dr. Frederick Verrill. Uh, with that said, I'm happy to introduce Dr. Frederick Verrill. Yeah, hello. Thank you so much um, for the introduction. It's a really great pleasure to be here. Thank you all for, for being here. Um, thanks the, the NOW conference team for having pulled off this conference um, that is so exciting and so needed in these crazy times uh, to have been able actually to push everything uh, into the virtual world, which is very exciting to test out how this works. Um, one great opportunity is that we are able to reach obviously more people. So I'm, I'm very excited to share um, my, my ideas and insights about LinkedIn and how I've been able to use this effectively <clears throat> to work on my own career and, and also work with students and colleagues uh, for several years um, to help them improve uh, their own career trajectory by finding key people uh, in this professional network that allow them to, to advance their careers and, and to get to the connections they need. Um, I really uh, want um, to thank also Luis. Um, so in the, representing all of the organizational team here, uh, you can give him a hand um, and also specifically for moderating uh, this session. Thank you very much for all your help you have been giving me and uh, also the help you're giving to the others, other speakers in preparing this. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen and kick off the presentation. Oh, I hope everybody can see this all right. I want to start um, by giving you a little bit of a background about me, and this is not to show off. This is actually just to illustrate how I've been using LinkedIn over time over about the last decade, a little bit more, um, to go from position to position. Um, I started off in 2011 as an associate professor back in France, and I used LinkedIn effectively there to um, find speakers. And uh, this allowed me to have much more engaging courses and classes and create a professional network uh, that was appreciated by, by the leadership back in the day. And so I was able or pulled into more um, course design, helping others out, program management, and eventually then uh, became director of academics um, in a business school where I then was able to use LinkedIn to find lecturers and I just went out into the world and found lecturers from around the globe, not just in France, to come into our courses, into our school and lecture, which obviously was very exciting to the school and also allowed me to connect um, and create a network internationally, which led to another position, which was um, Director of Accreditation and International Relations. And here I use LinkedIn specifically to find other partners <coughs> and other partners uh, partner universities that we could do exchange program with and so on and so forth. And by using LinkedIn, I was able to be much more strategic and therefore quite efficient as compared to um, other departments of internationalization as we um, had in, in competing business schools. So um, within that realm, I actually got also connected uh, to UC Berkeley, I was able to design a program with UC Berkeley come here and eventually got offered a position as director of international initiatives at Berkeley in the extension department. And I was there able then to use all of the below to function in this position very well. And in my successive position as assistant dean for academic design and innovation, and most recently uh, associate dean for academic affairs, I'm still using extensively LinkedIn to um, connect to meaningful people that will help me do a better job. And I want to give you this um, kind of know-how, these tricks through this uh, workshop. The workshop will be um, in two different uh, phases. But um, before we kick into this early phase, which will be a little bit more of a lecture, and then uh, the second part will be a little bit more interactive, I want to engage you beyond what I'm actually saying in the chat. I know that many of you have experience with LinkedIn. Uh, all of you have ideas about um, what LinkedIn is, and I want you to engage in the chat, ask questions, and also share um, whatever um, materials you have, ideas you have. And so do it now. Open your chat window and start typing in what uh, is LinkedIn according to you. Start sharing your ideas. And... Um, 
while you're doing this, um, please continue to, uh, to share um, resources you might have. If you have any questions, Louis will be monitoring them. And during the time that we are actually working um, through the more interactive part, um, so there will be slides where we, I jump over to LinkedIn, you'll be um, basically able to, or Louis will be able to feed me those questions and I can literally try to answer them while being on LinkedIn. Okay, <clears throat> I only see nine contributions. Come on, more action on the chat. So I see it's a place to find jobs, a professional social network, see successful career transitions, see what others are doing, the online resume. So I think a lot of this is actually true. Oh, now the chats are coming and that's great. <laughs> so I see that a lot of you have already uh, um, a good idea of how you can use LinkedIn more as more than just like the, the, the basic uh, network idea that many people have. Um, indeed, uh, many people go into LinkedIn at the beginning and think it's kind of a social network, but um, while it is so, it is so much more as well. It's definitely not a network where you connect with friends and you behave in a way where um, the way you would do on Facebook or Instagram. You behave in a, in a way as if you were at a professional conference or a meeting or at work. And that's the, the big difference here. So if you want to deeply understand what LinkedIn actually is, I want to walk you through a little example that could be close to actually what is happening to you at the moment. So you could imagine your Tom or you could say that's uh, your Tina and uh, you're working at Berkeley uh, for a while already and you have come across two job offerings, uh, one in college A where you know John is the dean and one in department B of another a college, for example, where the, the, the head of the department is the associate dean, Rob. And, um, well, you've never actually connected to any of your colleagues on LinkedIn, but you know the, uh, Alex from your own department. He's a work colleague. And you also know Kate um, through the NOW conference where you have mingled last year and, and met her. And you know that she has been working in the department that Rob is in. So, for the first time, you um, go out and actually connect to these people that you know from work. And because you know them from work, they're very likely to accept your invite and they become your first level contacts. Then automatically all their first level contacts or their colleagues that they're connected with become your second level contacts. And everybody else is a third level contact to you then. Now, if that connection is established, what Tom could do in this case uh, if you look on the lower part here, he could connect to Roy. And uh, Roy, when he would get the connection invite from Tom, would see, oh, Tom is connected to Kate. Kate is a fantastic person, very professional, very picky about who she accepts into her network. So if Tom is connected to Kate, Tom must be a great person and very valuable to be connected with. He might have a very interesting Yes, other I'm network. working. <laughs> And then once Tom would be connected to Roy, he could do the same thing to Mary. He could connect to, uh, reach out to Mary and say, hey, would you like to connect with me? And she would say, oh, well, he apparent, I don't know Tom, but he apparently knows Roy. Roy is a fantastic person, super good colleague. Whoever is connected to Roy must be a good person. I want to be connected to Tom as well. Same thing with Mark. Um, once connected to Mary, Tom can reach out to Mark and so on and so forth until Tom actually makes it close to Rob. So wait a minute, why actually do this? Why would Tom want to be connected to Rob if he's considering applying to a position in his department, knowing that Rob is not the hiring manager? Rob supervises that department. Well, exactly for that reason. If he supervises that department, that means that he also supervises Julie, who is the actual hiring manager. So effectively through LinkedIn, Tom can be connected to Julie's boss, even though he doesn't know him or anyone near him, 
in person or has never met them, probably will never meet them, potentially, unless he gets the job. Um, but he has been able to connect to him before he would send an application to Julie. So when Julie gets the application of Tom, she looks into what every, like does what everybody does, copies the um, name, puts it into Google, finds the LinkedIn um, profile of Tom, looks at him and then sees, oh, he's connected with people in our department. Oh, he's connected with my boss, Rob. Well, if that's the case, maybe I should invite him for an interview because if you're connected to the boss, you must be a great person. Now, um, Tom doesn't even need to stop there because he's connected to Rob. He could also send an invite directly to Julie, ask her to connect. Then he even has established a first contact. And imagine that effect um, when a few weeks later, Julie, or a couple of days later, potentially, Julie um, receives the application from Tom for the position. She remembers, oh, I've been actually uh, reached out by that person and that person is connected to Rob. So effectively, in a nutshell, what I'm trying to show you through the strategy that um, I'm outlining in this workshop is how to be connected to the boss of the person that will hire you before you send your application. Make sense? To be able to do this, to strategically target people within your company in a specific country, industry, a certain job, a certain person, um, or a group, um, an affiliation group, that you're looking to get into contact with, um, you need to build networks and you need to build them up. You can't start with uh, 10 contacts and go right away into the, the network where you want to be. It takes time. So it is something you can practice by connecting regularly every weekend to more and more people so that you will, at the moment when you want to apply, be close and likely uh, to be near somehow in terms of connections to the people that you need to be near to. To be able to be strategic like this, you really need this initial network, personal networks, professional networks, affiliation networks. And for those networks to accept you, you need a very good profile. And so this is the first step of everything. And I will quickly go through this, um, what a, a profile, um, a functioning profile can look like. And if you have a profile and you have spent time on it and you think, oh, this is going to be boring because uh, I spent so much time on my LinkedIn profile, um, stay tuned because what I'm going to say uh, might not be what you've read anywhere else. This is really about 10 years of experience of using LinkedIn and working with people in HR and also people actually directly at LinkedIn. The key thing about your own profile is that it needs to be authentic. Because what LinkedIn tries to do through the profile is to recreate a moment of contact as you would have had it in person. If you go to an event, a networking event, a conference, if you meet at work, what happens in person is that within the five, first five seconds, you build an opinion about people. And this is what LinkedIn tries to recreate with your picture, the profile picture, and the top background picture. This picture will generate a first impression that will be interesting to people or not. And what um, I've figured out works very well is if you try to be as authentic as possible in what you choose there. Authentic as if you were meeting in person. If you meet somebody and you put on a masquerade, what happens is that people might actually like that mask that you're wearing, the person that you pretend to be, but then if you take that into becoming a job, it will be very dreadful because eventually they'll figure out who you are and, and the relationship will not be great. Do the same thing on LinkedIn. If you are able to have a picture of yourself um, that shows who you are, that in this case, for example, I, I can't help myself but smile on a picture because I'm generally a happy person and I like to work in an environment where people can have fun and can laugh and be, and be happy. And uh, therefore, I, I put this out. This is me. If somebody hates that, if somebody is looking for some um, killer instinct uh, um, person uh, with a frown on the face, that might be very legitimate. Um, but that's not me. So it's better if that person doesn't think uh, 
that my profile would be interesting to them uh, if they don't think I have the right personality. So you can use this mindset to choose what you're going to put here. For the headshot, you have this perspective of be your authentic self. However, please try to conform to the industry standard. Um, that's very easy. Just look around you what other people have, people that have jobs you want to have how do they represent themselves and take an average or find something that you like? In this case, um, here in the U.S., it's it's still what I'm wearing here, kind of professional attire, um, but no tie and the, the smile. Uh, it's a very standard, also an international relations picture here. Um, when I was back in France, business school, I, I had much less of a smile, direct look and uh, suit and tie, but because that was the standard back in the day. Uh, in Europe. So I'm adapting there, but I'm still trying to be authentic. The background picture illustrates your ambitions and who you want to be. Um, in this case, I'm showing actually here uh, a background picture that is the wall, is a, is a mural um, in our San Francisco campus or the extension San Francisco campus, which talks about uh, lifelong learning. And this is really all I'm about. I am very engaged in continuous learning and making that something that uh, people practice and that empowers them to have fantastic careers and that they never stop learning throughout their life. So I'm illustrating who I want to be and what my ambitions are, truthfully. This will give a first impression of anyone who looks on my uh, LinkedIn profile. So don't underestimate this. And it mirrors this background picture, the about section. About section is probably by talking to a lot of people, the worst thing that everybody dreads to write because you don't want to brag. You don't want to talk about yourself. It's like, what am I doing here? Am I repeating all my experiences? I don't know what to write. Many people even like don't do it or it's either over the top exaggerations of how fantastic they are and it's not really authentic. Or on the other hand, it's, uh, it's bo a boring repetition of your experiences. Try to think of it as what happens when you meet somebody in person for the first time. First thing is you see visual input, that's the picture and uh, the background picture. But then you start talking, you say, uh, hi, my name is Frederick. Hi, my name is Tom. So what do you do? And that is exactly what you put into the about section. What do you do? If I'm in a professional context and somebody asks me, what do you do? I can answer, I lead the development and design of academic innovations at the extension department at UCB. And then I might go elaborate about my focus, what are my ambitions, what I'm trying to do. So in a nutshell, I'm trying to explain my ambitions and the impact that I want to have on the world through my work. So my tip for you here, if you want to build an impactful profile, an authentic profile, think of it as the first contact that you're having with a person through the pictures and through what you're pitching. The next step, the next thing that people will look at when they look at your LinkedIn is obviously the standard, your experiences. Here, however, there's a slight nuance in how you write it that will make it more impactful and more interesting for people to accept you into their network and for an employer to accept you for an interview. When you write your experience, explain what you know how to do today. Do not explain what you did in the job back then. And that's a slight nuance. So if you look at what I wrote here, I lecture marketing strategy, I actually tell them I'm capable of lecturing marketing strategy. And I give them the course number, could even link to the course and if they want to look into the syllabus to see what it is. If I say, as an assistant dean for academic design and innovation, I led the development of innovation processes. What I'm telling them is I'm able to lead the development of processes, whatever processes in whatever context. If I say, uh, lead the development, lead strategy, support, design, and implement, develop, I am telling them whatever it was that I'm capable of doing this. And so it's a slight tweak in the way I write it. It will illustrate your skills and competencies um, with concrete examples rather than um, being just a, a list of did this, did this, did this. 
So task, task, task. Here you say it's a concrete example. I'm leading the strategy, uh, strategic portfolio review of uh, projects within higher education. The next thing a recruiter will look for or somebody that you're contacting is your articles and your activity. And this is a crucial point and the main difference of LinkedIn to other social networks and is most of the time completely misinterpreted and misused. The articles are a very two-edged sword. Um, I take a lot of time preparing an article, usually a Saturday or a whole weekend, and I post them rarely because it's not about frequency here. It's about being able to show off how smart I am in a nutshell. Any recruiter or colleague who goes on this and reads one of the articles will just have it in front of them who I am. Am I smart enough to make a good argument? Am I smart enough uh, to argue well? Am I interested in topic areas that are relevant, relevant to them or in general? Um, is my conclusions that I draw from this, are they pertinent? I'm really opening up through what I publish so my um, recommendation for you is try to be very thoughtful and deliberate and do a lot of research and thinking and have that thing reread by people because um, any, um, anything you post as an article is a reflection of your competencies. Your activities are also crucial um, and they are very tricky. Um, your activities show what, activity, um, what you're involved with in your professional life. So you can support certain projects that are happening in your um, institution, for example. So people see that what you put into your experience is not just words. That's the difficulty of a CV or a resume. You just put out stuff, nobody can prove it. Here, you prove it. So with your activities and articles, they represent your portfolio of competencies. What you say in the experience is here is proof. You really need to focus on publishing well-researched, well-written articles. If you repost something, don't just repost it that's spamming other people. Add something with value to it. Add your opinion to it, your research. I reposted um, something from the World Economic Forum about solar cells in China and added other videos that I knew about um, this topic area that we're illustrating other aspects of it. So there's some value add and people can be interested in reading it. And again, I'm showing off actually um, my competencies. Um, however, whatever you do, be very careful and deliberate what and when you post because managers, HR, LinkedIn, algorithms of recruiters can see when you post it and when your activity is. So you really do not want to post all the day um, or at weird times because you might just give the impression very clearly that you're spending your time on LinkedIn rather than working and doing your work. There's really spikes that you see in LinkedIn analyses where most people, um, the, good, the people, the professionals post through during lunch hour or just after work or maybe on a Saturday morning. You also don't want to post every evening because that just shows you have no life. So be very deliberate about when you post. <clears throat> If you are engaged in activities that uh, are worth showing off, um, such as Luis is, uh, working in, the, um, um, in our career development program, use those activities and show them off. They are your portfolio illustrating your competencies. Again, this is not necessarily to just um, show off, but it is to prove that whatever you put in your experiences is actually truthful. Promote your achievements to build your own portfolio. And at the end, the uh, profile, there's a often forgotten section, which is interests. Interest is very important because at the very least, you should follow the department and university that you're interested in working in. So if you're not connected to Berkeley, um, you're not connected to the department, um, it, it shows that you're not even uh, interested in whatever they're posting on their, on their social media. You're not following their activity. Um, you might also want to follow interest groups um, that are most relevant to your field um, of interest and your expertise. So if I'm following uh, Harvard here, it's because they are very um, involved in academic innovation. So I want to know what's happening there. If I um, 
follow the Harvard Business Review is because I'm lecturing and I'm interested in the newest um, things that are coming out there for um, potential case studies. I've been working in international relations. So of course, I want to be member of the EAIE, the European Association for International Education, um, to be in contact with all the experts there. The cool thing is that as soon as you are a member group, everybody in that group becomes a second level contact to you. So imagine, even if you have a small network at the beginning and you want to work in international, you connect to EAIE, all those 9,000 members that are all experts in the field, all people working in international education are now available to you to connect with. And they might just accept your invitation because you have been accepted in that group, so vetted by peers, and um, because you, um, you share the same group affiliation. So let's explore. I'm gonna switch over to LinkedIn and just use again my, uh, my um, profile as an example. And uh, I'm opening up to Luis to feed me some questions. There is one question when you connect, do you have to send an eight personalized message even if you don't know them? That depends on who you're connecting to and how important it is for you. So if you have a real reason to connect to the person because you want to have a uh, discussion with that person or exchange information, I would indeed send a short message because you want to, to be connected with them. But a lot of the connections that happen on LinkedIn are effectively just trading networks. You're trading your network with another um, for access to your network for access to the other network. So oftentimes, and this is kind of an implicit understanding in, in LinkedIn, people will just accept your connection because they see that you are a person that uh, has a valuable network and is worth being connected to. If I would give a statistic, I'm probably only connecting with a message to the people that I really want to engage with um, as, for example, a lecturer or a colleague. Um, that's maybe 10% of the people I'm connecting to. Uh, all the others are people where I see that they are in interesting positions and interesting networks, and I just regularly on the weekend spend time growing my network and connecting to them. Hope that answers the question. So here, just um, to, to wrap it up, this is what you will see and what other people will see from your um, LinkedIn profile. I highly encourage you to um, make it in the settings so that it becomes public, so that anybody can see it. There's no point really in being on LinkedIn if uh, people can't find you um, in the internet with it. Um, you see that, uh, I just wanted to illustrate here that you can really go into detail and you should go into detail for all the positions that you've had. Again, the recruiter will read this with the perspective of, can that person do for me what I need today? It's not about, I don't care what the person did before. I want to know today, what are you capable of? Affiliate to all the uh, institutions that you've been studying at because through those institutions, you will be able to connect to other people. If you have publications, awards, you speak different languages, also put that there. Frederick, we have another question. Yep. Benefits of having LinkedIn Premium? Um, <laughs> the biggest benefit is you can <coughs> grow your network faster. Um, because since LinkedIn was bought up by Microsoft, they literally just block access to connection or to more connections um, if, you, if you start connecting regularly to people. So the more you send out invites, the more you search for people, um, LinkedIn will block that at some point. Um, if you are in a phase of growing your network, it's worth taking the premium. Um, if you are in a position where you're hiring, obviously it's very interesting to consider the, the premium, the sales, um, sorry, the, the hiring manager, LinkedIn. Uh, one of the issues we are facing and across universities actually is that oftentimes 
we restrict ourselves to purely open searches and we don't go out and hunt a lot for, for great profiles. If you really need great people to apply, there's no problem with um, going out, finding these people and engaging with them saying, hey, we have this position open. I saw your profile. I'd be very happy if you apply. And then they go through the official website at Berkeley and apply to that position. We have another question. What are some ways to find the networks that would be interesting in joining? This really depends on uh, what you want to do. So you know that when you go on search, you can go uh, look for groups. Um, if you want to work in higher education, I mean, this is really just the basics. You should search um, for groups in higher education and get knowledgeable about them and apply to them. Each group has their own wall, basically. So they will allow you to see on your wall what's happening uh, in that group. Um, these affinity groups also allow you to easily engage with the people that are there. So LinkedIn, again, it's about who you want to be. It's a tool that allows you to create your own path through your career um, by being very strategic and deliberate who you connect to, what groups you uh, affiliate with, um, rather than letting yourself like just be drifted through opportunities. We have another question. How to reach out to recruiters associated with job posts to make yourself more competitive? So how to connect with the recruiters in line with the job you want to go to. So this is basically the next step. So we can jump back into the, into the presentation. The idea is basically how do we do this, connect to the boss before you send in your application. Um, it, depend, um, it is basically the, the basic, the groundwork that you're doing on an ongoing basis that will put you um, or will create the network um, strong enough and connected enough so that when you apply to a position, you will be close already to the person that you're targeting. So the, the boss or the recruiter. So the first steps that you will need to do is to create your initial network. Um, very straightforward. Your personal network, that's all the people that will not refuse your uh, personal connection requests unless you have a beef with your, your, your sibling. Um, but otherwise, everybody, your family, your friends will accept your, your invitation and think large family. Like you might have an uncle, an aunt, uh, cousins. You are actually... Um, very well connected and, and have interesting careers. So reach out to everybody in that field to build your base network and really just do that. You should be connected to, to all the good people in your environment. Um, <clears throat> people that are likely to accept your connection requests are mostly your professional network, the people that are current or former colleagues and supervisors, um, alumni from your high school, college and university. And then the affiliate networks, what I was just showing, um, are these people that are part of a professional group or an affinity group on LinkedIn who will be likely to accept your invitation because you're part of the same interest group. How to do this? You go on the search bar and you click on people. <clears throat> you go into all filters. And in the all filters, you go, for example, on current companies and you choose University of California, Berkeley, in my case, uh, Berkeley Extension as well. <clears throat> and I will find all the people that are currently working there and I can reach out to them. Or I can go to schools, it's another rubric, and uh, select both uh, universities that I've been going to and hit search. And then I can start connecting to people just because we have the same affiliation um, in terms of a, of a network. And they are likely to accept my invitation just because we went to the same university. So I can grow this basic network very strongly and it takes time <clears throat> and it's something you can work on basically every day or every weekend if you want. This builds up your connections and if you know a little bit about network theory, we are all but a few connections away actually from each other. So by building up this uh, basic network, you're um, making really the first steps to where, like, yeah, to answering your question, to where you want to be. Um, 
which is the, the hiring manager. So I'm just gonna retrace this. I click here on people. This is where you have all your filters and this is where you can start filtering. So example here for school, this is one of my schools and I can apply that search and it will have 164,000 people that I can connect with. Are there any more questions that came in that I could answer at this stage while I'm on it? Yes. Uh, what is your advice in using LinkedIn to find jobs in internationally? Internationally? Well, let's go to the next step. That's, uh, that will show you exactly how you can then, then do this when we refine these filters. Because I just chose one university here that I've been going to, and I see 164,000 uh, 164, results. So I'm not going to connect with 164,000 people, right? So I need to be more specific and more deliberate in reaching out at some point. How to do that? How to become strategic when you build your network? This is where really the fun starts. You can start targeting specific companies, countries, industries, jobs, people, affiliation groups. And the trick is to actually combine filters. So let's say I'm just combining where I currently work with where I went to school. So it's not an or, it's an and. And I do the search. What happens is I find 11 people that have been going to the same universities I've been going and that are working at Berkeley. And those people I can connect to. I might not need the connection or want to meet with them in the, in the near future or ever, but they are just likely to accept my invitation because of the affiliation and the similarities uh, in our past. And what it creates is that suddenly I have a contact to a visiting professor. I might have a contact uh, of a lecturer in French um, and others. So I'm suddenly having connections in departments across Berkeley. Each connection getting me closer to a potential future employer. I can also filter for uh, industry, quote unquote, what they are doing, the job type, and choose, for example, people that are at Berkeley and work in education management. And they also see a smaller selection, like 873 people. Um, and I see there's a director of operations at UC Berkeley. That might be a cool person to be connected with because that person is very likely to be connected to a lot of other influential people at the university. Um, the business, a business manager at UC Berkeley and so on and so forth. I can even be more specific and say, okay, I want people in education management who have in their title manager. And then if I do this filtering, I come down to 12 results and this allows me to find and connect to or reach out to um, 12 managers in various departments across Berkeley. This is part of building up my network that will naturally get me closer to potential hiring uh, people. Now, to address this specific question of doing this internationally, um, you can do this by cross-referencing these filters. So let's say um, past companies, somebody who has worked at UC Berkeley somebody who is working in education or higher education went to one of my universities and I don't know which country the person is interested in. Do we know? No specifics. Okay. Let's say I wanted to work in New Zealand. Singapore. Oh, New Zealand. Oof. I will know. I'm not sure if I will know anyone in New Zealand. But let's see. And I apply. Nobody found. So I can take off a filter. Aha, uh -huh, 12 people that worked like me at Berkeley are now in, in New Zealand and working in higher education. So these are people I can connect to. And they will not necessarily be the people to hire me. But these will be the people working at the University of Auckland who, which is potentially the university I might want to apply to 
or which is the university I want to have a partnership with, develop a, a research partnership. So through this affiliation, we both worked at Berkeley and we are in higher education. Um, Manuel Vallée is likely to uh, accept my invitation. He's a lecturer. Um, I don't know in which subject. Environmental sociology, not at all my thing. I would apply for something in marketing, but he's likely to accept my invitation. If he does, then I have a contact at uh, the University of Auckland. I want to strike up an international research partnership uh, in marketing. He is likely to be connected to other people at the University of Auckland. And uh, therefore, I come closer to the potential marketing researcher that I want to be connected with. Does we have sense? another. Yep. Yes, we have another question. Yep. Um, what is the best way to use LinkedIn if you have two distinct professional careers, different cohorts of professionals? So the person themselves has two different professional careers. So it could be a lecturer on one side and, I don't know, a working professional on the other side. Correct. Um, I would say it just takes more work because you need to probably, you would want to um, explain both in your career, in your career path, in your profile. Um, and you want to reach out into networks as well in education, as well as in your professional career. So you effectively just um, have, you will have to work more. Each thing on its own is a, is a strategy to develop and a field to develop. That makes sense. Uh, and we have another question. What are your suggestions about dealing with age discrimination when applying for jobs? Emphasizing experience, um, I would assume, would be important. Well, this is the beauty of a of a link uh, of LinkedIn as compared to a CV, because the the LinkedIn is really a, a living thing, um, where the CV or resume is is kind of pretending something nobody knows really if it's true so if you write a good resume um, people see this and they might say oh yeah but potentially this person even though it's not allowed is like too old or older than what i expected uh, or too young the uh, the other way around they might still look on your linkedin profile and by the way it's a good idea to provide the link to your linkedin profile everywhere when you apply and then see your activities. And if you're posting interesting articles, you're involved in the right things. You have a lot of followers. People, um, what you write makes sense and is pertinent and really applies to what the, the position is all about and what the hiring um, committee is looking for. You really have a shot there. So where you, you can always say, oh, I'm so experienced in your, in your resume, LinkedIn, you can show it. And the, the hiring manager might actually look at the, the article and read this and say, oh, wow, I see like the depth of, of analytical capacities of somebody who's actually just like graduated. That's impressive. This is what I'm looking for. I'm going to consider that candidate where I would have not considered that candidate really um, potentially for a lack of experience um, if I hadn't had that chance. By the way, as a side note, I'm not using my profile um, out of vanity. I'm just using it because that's the only way uh, nobody can complain and I can't get uh, um, scolded afterwards for saying something about a profile. So so don't take that wrong at all. I'm, I'm it's, it's not vanity, it's just um, I don't want to pick on other people's profiles. We have, we have another question. If you haven't updated your profile and want to include content and changes from a while ago, how do you do, how do you add that? Oh, well, I mean, effectively, technically, it's obviously very easy. You can go back as much as you want. Um, edit this part. You can edit almost anything in there. What is important again uh, uh, most people that I've seen, I don't know if that's the, the core of the question. Most of people that I've seen is like this blank page of, oh, should I just list what I did? Um, 
and and that's boring and I don't want to do it and I don't remember exactly all what I did. At this point, just put in what were your motivations, what were your achievements. It's very close to effectively what you're doing today in Achieve Together or in an in a uh, performance review. It's just what did you achieve back then that you can use today. Uh, like for example, I said like there was a program I've created and taught three modules. Um, so now people know that I can create and teach modules for a course. Okay, so always think, what did I do back then? And then write it in a way that people will understand what you're capable of doing today. Because you did it, you just, the easiest example is, oh, I was a, like the students have this like first year, oh, I did an internship and I was uh, in, in sales and then I was a cashier and I, um, I talked, uh, I was in discussion with, with, um, with clients. That doesn't tell me if you know how to discuss with clients or if you know how to man the register. If you say I managed, I closed, I, I opened, I oversaw, I engaged, I was in charge of um, managing client relations and engaged in sales discussions. It's the same thing. You did the same thing. You're just writing it in a way that now I know uh, you're a person who can effectively engage in a sales discussion. And we have another question. Does it make sense to be networking right now during the pandemic? Most universities have implemented hiring freezes. If I'm trying to find a new opportunity, but there's no one hiring now, I feel like I would get just get my hopes up and ultimately be disappointed because folks are not hiring as much now. So there's not much, I think, hiring going on. Obviously, um, there is still possibility to evolve in your career. And um, there's lateral moves. There is internal uh, hiring. There's also just the possibility of uh, putting yourself out there more. Um, I would say it's the, the best moment to network. Um, within the university, obviously, there's fantastic people. Um, this is the, the, the number one, number two public university in the world. Actually, many people that I meet on a day-to-day basis uh, seem to not be completely conscious about this. This brand, having this email address, having this on your CV is, is absolutely, absolutely fantastic. And everyone that is at Berkeley is a person that is worth being connected to. So if you start just reaching out naturally, growing uh, through affinity groups, through similarities and in interests, similar positions or positions you would aspire to um, on LinkedIn, what happens is that the people that are maybe not currently hiring but in desperate need of help will see your profile pop up, will see your contributions, your articles, will, will I have to say, acknowledge that you're there, that you're very close, and will be able to have you on their radar. Um, many a times, uh, reaching out to some colleague is a way that you can actually get knowledgeable and particularly they get knowledgeable about your competencies, your ambitions. And when you are in a position where maybe you're not advancing right now because there is no way up in that position, there might be another department that just received a ridiculous uh, research fund and is looking to grow massively and uh, they might get an exception out of the hiring freeze. So definitely this is for me the best time to grow your network and to aggressively grow it now. And there's another question. Does LinkedIn show the date you changed or added content? I believe not. Um, we can make a test. By the way, this is where you see that I'm not a sales rep. I do use LinkedIn a lot. I'm not getting anything for this. I'm not being paid at all. I wish. Um, yeah. So I'm using the incognito. So I'm not signed in. And I recently changed this. Nope. There's no indication of when I changed it. And even if there were, 
best case is actually not that bad, worst case, because then people see that you care, that you're updating and keeping your LinkedIn profile up to date, but it doesn't seem that it is actually effectively showing it. And if I'm just changing a few words or sentences, is there a way to suppress any update alerts? Oh yeah, whenever you, you click on save, it will ask you whether or not you want to make this update public. So like for example, here the about section, I, I review this regularly. Um, here obviously I'm going back into the descriptions of my positions as they evolve and put that in. And every time it asks, do you want to update or like let everybody know? And most of the time, if it's not a new position, I just say no. There are no more questions and we have about five minutes, Frederick. Okay. So from my side, <clears throat> these were the, the main um, points I wanted to make for you. And I wanted to use the opportunity um, just to re-emphasize at the end the, the power of these filters. So again, you go on people and actually the, the, the key um, filter that I've been able to use um, which will be essential for you to strategically grow your network into the company that you want to be in. Oh, by the way, let's take this as an as a example. Um, you might want to connect um, us to the Haas School of Business within Berkeley. And if I, if I just apply that filter, I have a lot of people that I could connect to. But if you want to be strategic, once you have achieved your fundamental networks and you want to be deliberate about reaching out, of course it makes sense to, to reach out to anyone you can, only if there are so many people that it's not feasible. That's where you start to filter down um, specifically in a way where first you connect to people of the same level. So at, say you're a coordinator. You want to connect to somebody at Haas. Only 28 results if I look for people that have in their job title coordinator. <clears throat> that will get you into the peer group. But you want to be hired as a coordinator, for example. So you might want to actually connect to the managers. You could also say, well, the managers, they don't really know me. They might not accept my invitation. So let's see, is there any way I can actually get to the dean or any associate dean? So I have 19 people here. Why would they connect with me? Well, they're in the same institution, but they're very high up. Well, potentially, they might have gone to the same school that you did. Um, I, I don't know if that's the case. I have two universities I went to. Is there anyone with Dean in their title at Haas that I connect with? No. Well, deans are like a group. They know each other across um, the University of uh, Berkeley. So maybe I check if there's anyone at Berkeley with Dean in their title. Oh, there's just me who went to the same schools. No luck. I might want to go into another way, uh, another affiliate group. This is a good example of, I don't know, I'm not connected to many deans here um, at, uh, at Berkeley. From my associate dean position, I might be able to approach them now from any other position that might not be possible. So that's a good example of where I have to do work. I will therefore not start with trying to reach out necessarily to the deans, but I will go for um, the managers. Oops, manager, not managers. And so I'm building my network to get closer and closer to these high level people. Oh. That's what happens if you announce in your position a ton of people reach out to you. Okay. So in a nutshell, as a take-home message for everybody, 
consider that LinkedIn is a living representation of yourself. It's a, it is a platform where you have the opportunity to show who you really are. And if you see it um, as an interaction, an asynchronous interaction that is similar to what uh, or that is mimicking uh, real in-person interaction, it will help you a lot write your uh, profile, write the right things. It will help you a lot in guiding um, your publications, your articles, everything you put out there. And if you regularly work on your network and you reach out to the peer groups that you can reach out and you reach out strategically to people that are in the same job categories just above and do this on a regular basis, you will build the network that will bring you successively closer to the people in power who will then be the bosses of the hiring managers. Within weeks already, you can have great results and you can grow your network, uh, um, your network by hundreds of people. Um, if you want to, uh, if you run out of um, ability to connect because LinkedIn is blocking you, just know if you have never used it before, you have uh, oftentimes a free subscription um, for a month um, that you can use, for example, to really for a month, almost every day, uh, build your network, connect systematically, use the filters to triangulate uh, job categories, departments, job styles, um, so that you can build up to the, um, to the people you need to be connected with. <clears throat> Thank you very much for, for your attention. If you have any questions or, or comments, um, please don't hesitate to reach out afterwards. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm a colleague of yours, so you can reach me by email. You can also reach me by uh, GChat. Um, thank you very much for, for having, uh, asked, or having asked so many questions. It was exciting to, to interact with you. And I'm very much looking forward to hopefully seeing you all in person at some point in the near future uh, when COVID is over. Thank you very much. Thank you, Frederick. Um, we have uh, two final questions you can answer, and then we'll go over the wrap for everyone um, to finalize and then evaluations. How much of a disadvantage is it to be searchable only by those who logged into LinkedIn as opposed to searchable on the internet? I can cite, um, well, to be honest, most people are connected to LinkedIn when they look for you. Um, there's a rare occasion where somebody is not logged in currently somehow in their browser to LinkedIn and they will search for you. I would just not necessarily take the risk um, of not being found um, because of something I learned in, in the Bay Area actually where people told me if you're not on LinkedIn, you don't exist. Um, so that was a little bit harsh I found, but uh, that's, that's basically the feedback that I got. You can parameter a lot of what is visible to the public. So if you feel there's things you don't want to share with everybody, um, whether or not they have LinkedIn, I would say just spend some time on parametering or setting the parameters of what you want to be really fully public. But otherwise, I mean, this is, this is who you are. This is who you want to be. Um, the more you're out there, the more you can be found. And uh, I would encourage you to, to show yourself. And then the last question, if you're not actively job searching, how critical is it to regularly post share content if you might be searching later? Um, I think the regularity is not the key aspect to it. So the, this is how it d differentiates really with other social networks. Um, like, you're not entertaining an audience like you do on, on Instagram or, or others, and you're not chatting with friends like you do on, on Facebook or Snapchat or so. Um, this is a, a way to show that what you put into your experiences is not just um, imagination. It's really truthful. So if you are regularly engaged or you are from time to time engaged in activities um, that are worth posting about. Um, example of Louis uh, hosting some uh, networking events and so on. Do that because it will just show that you are indeed engaged and currently working on these things. Um, if you post articles, 
like people will not think that, oh, he didn't post an article or she didn't post an article for two years. Therefore, suddenly she became stupid, right? You write an article to show how smart you are, uh, how analytical you are to, to put forward um, your qualities. They don't get away with time. So you don't need to be uh, having like an Instagram uh, influencer strategy there um, to push content down the throat of people and, and be visible all the time. Um, if a recruiter is looking for somebody, they don't, like, they're not following a wall and, and see you pop up all the time and then, oh my gosh, that person is posting every day. I really need to hire that person. They have search engines to do this and, and algorithms. So they'll find you however often you actually post. Me personally, I'm a little bit getting tired of, uh, I would say, um, I don't know if it's a generational thing, but there's more and more, um, I noticed younger people coming on LinkedIn using or misusing LinkedIn uh, similar to Instagram, like even posing on their picture in very uh, weird poses, um, posting stuff like weekend jokes and so on and so forth. Unless that's really related to your job and this is who you want to be and you, you aspire to being hired by uh, a team where they appreciate you sharing like pictures of, of funny cats and stuff, then I would not do that. It's, yeah, it's a professional network. Thank you, Frederick. It was a great presentation. Um, uh, after the break, you will also want to be ready for afternoon workshop sessions. I uh, hope to see you all there. So thank you very much for attending this session. Thank you, Frederick. Thank you all. Have a wonderful day and enjoy the conference. Mm -hmm.